Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a few moments ago in Exodus chapter 8. Today we're looking at verses 16 through 19. Exodus chapter 8, verses 16 through 19. Now, most of you have probably noticed that we've had a very difficult time in doing an uninterrupted series on the uh, plagues in Egypt, uh, but today we're going to try to get back into gear with that, with that study. Next week, unfortunately, we're going to have another, not unfortunately, very nicely. We'll be having the Women's Missionary Society Missionary Sunday, so we'll have to break for the missionary speakers, uh, and we encourage you to be here for that entire weekend. I think you'll receive a great blessing on Friday evening, Saturday evening, and all day on Sunday for Mission Sunday. Also, uh, those of you who know Sebastian and Kayla, the Lord willing, Sebastian and Kayla and their kids are going to be driving up here from Alabama next week to be with us because Sebastian is going to be making a presentation of his research into the signaling pathways in ovarian cancer at the largest annual scientific cancer research conference in Philadelphia the following week. And so that family will be around all week. And also Evangeline and Jorge will be with us for that weekend as well. So uh, we encourage you all to be out if you'd like to see them and also participate in the missions conference. Now, in the middle of all these interruptions, we've so far covered of those ten plagues in Egypt. We spent two weeks on the first plague, which was turning water to blood. That was February 22nd and March 1st. Then we had two weeks with guest speakers, Reverend Daniel Waite and Reverend Keith Coleman. Then we spent one week on the second plague, which was the plague of frogs. Uh, frog bread, if you remember, because um, the frogs were in their kneading troughs, too. Uh, and then that was followed by two weeks of the Passion Week, Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday. So today, the Lord willing, we're going to get back to the plagues with the plague of lice. But so that we have background into that, and I think rather importantly so that we do, I'm going to give a very brief summary of each of those first two plagues and what we covered. Because that's necessary to understand why lice is plague number three. And what does it have to do with the plague of blood? And what does it have to do with the plague of frogs? And what does it have to do with those passages that we saw in Revelation uh, that tie those first two plagues together? And so very quickly, the first thing we learned in that plague of blood was we started with the practical application, if you recall, of what God showed Moses about Pharaoh's heart and covered the practical lessons of how believers have to be fruit inspectors. Because each of the plagues we discover, Pharaoh has a hardened heart. And that is a major theme, not only in the Old Testament, which is really magnified for us by Pharaoh, but it is a problem in the New Testament as well. And believers are told to watch out for it. And so we started with the practical applications that although Moses could not see Pharaoh's heart, only his external response, it was obvious from what God said about Pharaoh that Pharaoh had hardened his heart. God confirms what we can already see. And that is why God gives us the lesson of the fruit inspectors. Sending Christians hate the idea of fruit inspectors and hit you with a quote, judge not lest ye be judged. But they fail to read what Jesus said in the next verse, for with what judgment you judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. In other words, Jesus was not saying that you can never judge, but only that you must not be a hypocrite when you judge. We saw that the New Testament further gave us multiple categories. We're not going to go over all of those, but multiple categories of people whose lifestyle requires us to separate from them and exclude them from fellowship in the church. And I think you're beginning to see how people with certain types of perverted lifestyles are not only influencing, but infiltrating into so-called evangelical churches, and evangelical churches are not taking any stands against it. Fruit inspection is going to become a very important issue in the very near future. That's practical application. We can examine the fruit of a person's life and lips and compare it with what the Word of God has to say so we can see what's in the person's heart. Most Christians don't realize how big the issue of lifestyle fruit is in the Bible. We saw that John 15, there are four stages of fruit bearing in the Christian life. Number one, bearing fruit. Number two, bearing more fruit. Number three, bearing much fruit. Number four, bearing abiding fruit. Jesus talks about all four of those in John 15. In the parable of the sower, he also talked about how some bear more fruit than others, but all will bear fruit if they are saved. Fruit bearing in the New Testament is inseparably welded to the intake and nourishing and flourishing of the Word of God in our hearts as the Holy Spirit 
causes spiritual growth in the life of the believer. It will happen. And so we summarize that at the end of the message, you recall, by my one little question that you've heard me ask many times. So, you say you're a Christian. How has it changed your life? God takes you as you are, but he doesn't leave you as you are. If you're truly saved, God changes your life. If you're truly saved, you will bear fruit. If you're truly saved, the Holy Spirit will prune you of the things that are in your life that are preventing the fruit and will produce the fruit in your life. And we see that as the ninefold fruit of the Spirit in Galatians. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Though fruit will be born in your life because God will not leave you alone if you are a saved person. We looked at several dozen passages in the New Testament dealing with fruit bearing, concluded that if there's no spiritual fruit in your life, it means you're probably not saved. The warning that Paul gives, examine yourself carefully before it's too late. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobate. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Then on March 1st, we did the exegetical part of our study. Blood, the first plague. Why was it blood for the first plague? And first we saw, as many have already pointed out, that every plague is a judgment against a specific god of Egypt. The Nile was one of the principal gods of Egypt because it was worshipped as the source of life. There could be no life in Egypt without the Nile. So the first reason that water was turned to blood as the first miracle was because God was pointing to himself as creator. We're going to see that again today. The ultimate and the only source of life. It was God who created life, not some inanimate source that creates life. The first plague was practical application for us today also. Life did not spontaneously arise in a primordial soup of chemicals composed of hydrogen and oxygen as posited by the evolutionists. The very first plague was designed to establish God as the creator of life. God always goes back to his glory as creator first before moving on. We studied that in Paul's sermon on Mars Hill in Acts 17 in the evening worship services. Second, the second reason is closely related to the first reason. God specifically stated that the location in which he puts life was in the blood. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes an atonement for the souls. The location is in the blood. That's why God, under the law, prohibited Israel from eating blood like the pagans did, and this prohibition was a reminder to Israel of the first plague by which he had redeemed them. Third, the plague of blood is also the picture of something else that angers God, and that is very clear in our text, the hardened heart. Blood is closely connected to the heart in the Bible. We've just been told that God hardened Pharaoh's heart and Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And we saw that about half of the instances where it speaks of Pharaoh's hardened heart, half the time it talks about Pharaoh hardening his heart, half the time it talks about God hardening his heart. God is sovereign, man is accountable. What you do, you cannot simply blame on God and say, well, you know, God made me do it so I'm not accountable. God says you are accountable. For your sin, you can't just blame God on that. You can't just say, well, you know, there's a sovereign God and he controls everything, even the hairs on our head. So therefore, I am not responsible for my sin. God says you are. God says you are. And that's why we see half the times it speaks of Pharaoh hardening his heart. Half the times it speaks of God hardening Pharaoh's heart. Very important for us to understand, just like the living fish died and began to stink in the river. The living cells in the body die when the blood is no longer circulating. They begin to rot and stink. The rotting blood is a picture of the spiritually dead, hardened heart of Pharaoh. Fourth, the fourth reason stated in Leviticus 17, there must be blood for an atonement. And I just quoted the verse for you. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the souls. Leviticus 17:11. Blood, which is the vessel of life, is required to make an atonement for sin. All the rotting blood in the Nile could never make an atonement for sin. Dead blood or blood infected with death can never make atonement for the soul. Only pure living blood could do that. Pharaoh worshipped the Nile as a source of life. Pharaoh's source of life was dead. It was a false hope. It was a stinking, rotting, undrinkable river filled with death. It brought death to the fish in it, and it could not be drunk to give life. Only the precious blood of Jesus Christ is a pure river that can give life and make an atonement for our souls and for our consciences. We looked at that principle doctrine explanation in the New Testament, which is found in Hebrews 9. Blood is mentioned there specifically 11 times. 
and tells us that only the blood of Christ can make an atonement for our souls. Further, the blood sacrifice had to be offered by a qualified priest, not a pagan priest or a magician. The magicians turned water to blood. Very unhelpful if they were trying to impress Pharaoh. Pharaoh needed water to drink, not more blood. Further, notice it says that all the water was stored that was stored in the vessels throughout the land of Egypt also turned to blood, which proved that there was not just a natural occurrence of a red mudslide into the river upstream. And as we pointed out in that lesson, the Nile begins in Lake Tanganyika and is 4,157 miles long, which is longer than the United States is wide by an additional 35%. That is a lot of blood. It runs south to north, unlike most other rivers in the world. It was not a natural event. It was a supernatural event that God gave there. Fifth, we saw that the plague of blood is a portent of future judgments on the world. We noted that the plague of blood in, is also seen in the book of Revelation. Blood is mentioned 17 times. Sometimes it relates to the blood of Christ. Sometimes it relates to the blood of the martyrs. But seven times, like the seven days of the plague of the blood of the Nile River, it relates to a specific judgment. We saw how the judgments in Revelation are divided into the seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. And God gives the earth increasing judgments of blood as we move from the seals to the trumpets to the bowls. In that, we also saw that it concluded the two witnesses, whom I believe, of course, are Moses and Elijah. I talked about that. They have power to turn the water to blood, just like Moses and Aaron turned the water into blood. We close the study on the plague of blood with a sobering observation that just like in the days of Moses, in Revelation, God gives them blood to drink. If you allegorize Revelation, you must also allegorize the plagues of Exodus, just like the liberals do. Covenant theology, which allegorizes the book of Revelation and opens the door, opens the door for liberalism. The plague of blood is foundational to all the plagues that follow, and we're going to see that again today, and foundational to understanding the judgments of God in the book of Revelation. Remember, the ten plagues in Egypt are foundational for what happens in Revelation. Very important. So if you want to allegorize those things away, you can allegorize Revelation. If you allegorize Revelation, you've got to allegorize away all those, those plagues in Egypt, and the liberals would love to do that. That leads down the road to unbelief. Then we talked about fresh frog bread. God didn't send crocs, uh, crocodiles. He didn't send river birds. He didn't send river snakes. That would have been a lot scarier. He, did, he didn't send hippos. He sent frogs. But there was a reason. Of course, they're obnoxious and annoying. We saw them landing in everybody's beds and all their ovens and all their kneading troughs and showing up in their bread. Uh, but more than that, frogs were one of the gods of Egypt. God said, you like frogs, I'll give you frogs. But they were more of an irritation, it would seem, on the surface than a danger. But God was saying something more. Frogs are found in the statues of demon gods in Mexico, South America, China, Africa, and in almost every culture. Obviously, we saw that frogs appear prominently in the book of Revelation in relation to demons. I want to stop. I didn't say this last week, but let me say it anyway here. How many of you have cute little frog statues sitting around your house? Revelation 16:13. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of devils, working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to battle to that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Haramageddon. God was attacking a major demon when he made frogs come out of the river. And then when he killed them all and let the land of Egypt stink as they gathered them into heaps. That brings us to the third plague that we want to look at today, the plague of lice. And the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch out thy rod and smite the dust of the land that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And they did so. For Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and smote the dust of the earth. And it became lice in man and beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice. But they could not. So there were lice upon man and upon beast. Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, This, this is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And he hearkened not unto them. 
as the Lord had said. The first thing that I hope that you see in this miracle is that the magicians were not able to duplicate the miracle. They had duplicated the blood miracle, they duplicated the frog miracle, both of those very, very unhelpful. But in this third miracle, the magicians themselves suddenly begin to realize that they are not putting their demons against some demon controlled by Moses. Pharaoh's own magicians gave him a warning that the contest had suddenly moved outside the realm of parlor magic and petty activities of demons. Do you remember those verses back in chapter 7 and 8 where they copied Moses' miracles? There was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. This is 7, 21 and 22. And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Neither did he hearken unto them as the Lord had said. And then chapter 8, verse 7, about the frogs. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. Of course, then Pharaoh hardens his heart again. But here, Pharaoh has no excuse. His magicians can't do it. And yet Pharaoh still hardened his heart. How hard a heart is that? How hard a heart is it when you see that you can't duplicate it, you are warned by the very people whom you have trusted, and you still harden your heart? There are people in America, perhaps even people here in this room, who have hardened their heart and chosen to reject Christ. Are you there? But when we get to the lice down here in verses 18 and 19 of chapter 8, magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth life, but they could not. So there were lice upon man and upon beast. First thing to note, magicians could not copy. Second thing to note, I hope you saw this, this is a miracle of creation. The first miracle, turning water to blood, pointed to God as the creator of life. The life of the flesh is in the blood. In the second miracle, the frogs came out of the river, but nothing is said about their direct creation. But listen to what the text says about the lice. The Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch out thy rod, and smite the dust of the land, that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And they did so, and Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod, and smote the dust of the earth, and it became lice in man and in beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. God turned dust into lice. I think that's rather interesting and also very instructive because of the parallel to the creation account of Adam. It's also a lesson in just how far man fell when the second miracle of creating out of the dust was not the noble creation of man, but the onerous creation of lice. Genesis 2.7 tells us, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. All three of these first miracles have, have gone back and reminded us of God the Creator and what he did. Back in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Rather interesting also as we go on that dust was also part of the curse against the serpent, the devil. In chapter 3, verse 14, we read, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. Part of the curse on the serpent. Rather interesting. As we see Moses taking his rod and casting it down before Pharaoh, Aaron's rod. And it ate up all the serpents of the rods of the magicians. The serpent eats dust. We find that dust was also part of the curse against man because of his sin. Genesis 3.19 In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it thou wast taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Dust, part of the curse against man because of his sin. But you know we find that dust is also used as a symbol of God's blessing on Israel, the promised descendants of Abraham through Isaac. Genesis 13, verse 16, And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Chapter 28, verse 14, 
and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. Thou shalt spread abroad unto the west, and unto the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. We find it in the words of Balaam, trying to curse Israel, but he couldn't. Numbers 23.10, who can count the dust of Jacob? And the number of the fourth part of Israel, let me die the death of the righteous, and let my last end be like his. You know, there are many, many other references to dust that have very important significance, though we can't cover all of them here today, obviously. But let me just mention a few. There are many more. Dust is used in another of the plagues in Exodus. We find it in the plague of the boils. Chapter 9, verse 9, we'll be seeing in a few weeks, the Lord willing. And it shall come, become small dust in all the land of Egypt, and shall be a boil, breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beast throughout all the land of Egypt. That'll take us back to creation again and to the curse. We'll see when we get there. Dust is a sign of leprous uncleanness. And we find that when there was a house that had leprosy, he shall cause the house to be scraped within and about, and they shall pour out the dust that they scrape off without the city into an unclean place. The sign of leprous uncleanness. Dust is used in legal judgment when the woman who is suspected of adultery, it says the priest shall take holy water in an earthen vessel, and of the dust that is in the floor of the tabernacle, the priest shall take it and put it into water, and then the woman's made to drink it. Dust is a sign of humility. Joshua 7, verse 6. Joshua rent his clothes and fell on the earth and upon his face before the ark of the Lord until eventide. He and the elders of Israel and put dust upon their heads. Dust is a picture of death. Job 7, 21 and 10, 9. And why dost thou not pardon my transgression and take away mine iniquity? For now shall I sleep in the dust. And thou shalt seek me in the morning, but I shall not be. Remember, I beseech thee, that thou hast made me as the clay, and wilt thou bring me again unto the dust. Some very significant things going on here when God tells him to strike the dust and turn it into lice. Now let's talk about lice for a minute. Again, I think we can marvel at God the Creator, since this is a miracle of creation, just like Jesus turning the water into wine at Cana of Galilee or multiplying the loaves and the fishes. Did you ever stop and think, I bet you didn't, did you ever stop and think that lice are a marvelous creation of God? <laughs> How many of you have ever you sat and pondered and just smiled in yourself and thought, lice are such an incredible, marvelous creation of God? Anybody ever done that? <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> did you know that under the curse they're also a very dangerous creation? Let me get you a few facts about lice. But you didn't know this either. There are over 3,000 species of lice. Now, we know there are thousands of different kinds of birds, and we know there are thousands of different kinds of fish. Did you know there are over 3,000 different kinds of lice? Yes, you, you'll get that for the next time you have some kind of a, a game show quiz. Um, there are two types of lice. There are chewing lice, and there are sucking lice, blood-sucking lice. Three types of lice are classified as human disease agents. Lice affect every type of bird and mammal except the platypus. Did you know platypus don't have lice? <laughs> the spiny anteater, bats, whales, dolphins, porpoises, and pangolins. How many of you know what a pangolin is? Okay, we got one in the back. Knows what a pangolin is. A pangolin. Do you know what a pangolin is? A pangolin is a spiny, uh, is a scaly anteater. Not the spiny anteater. They don't have lice either. But scaly anteaters that can climb trees and which look like armadillos. Lice are scavengers. They feed on skin and other debris found on the body. Some feed on oily secretions of the body and are blood suckers. Some animals can host up to 15 different species of lice at the same time. Three types of lice infect humans and inhabit different regions of the body. And they don't cross over. They infect the scalp, they infect the body, the hairy areas of the torso, or they're called body lice, but they usually live in clothing because most humans don't have a lot of hair on their bodies, and the pubic hair. And each of those three types only inhabits one area. They attach firmly to the hair with specialized blue-like saliva. saliva. You say, oh, that's very interesting. What's that got to do with the message today, <laughs> other than the fact that it took up some time and it's about lice? <laughs> okay, let me tell you what it has to do with the message. Let me give you some of the dangerous aspects of lice and why this was not just an inconvenience on the land of Egypt, why this was indeed a judgment of God on the land of Egypt. Life, lice reduce the life expectancy of the host. Very clearly documented in scientific literature. 
Lice transmit microbial disease and helminth parasites. Lice are one of the principal causes of epidemic typhus. Typhus and several similar diseases being caused by Rixia bacteria. And by the way, that word for uh, typhus comes from the Greek typhos, meaning smoky or hazy. It describes a state of mind of those affected by typhus. It's accompanied by back pain, delirium, high fever, joint pains. Think of lice in Egypt as you think about this. Low blood pressure, sensitivity to light, rashes, severe headaches, and severe muscle pains. It produces abdominal pain, gangrenous sores, stinking, rotting flesh, backache, dull red rash that begins in the middle of the body and spreads, hacking, dry, cough, and vomiting. Lice all over Egypt, all the dust of the land of Egypt turned to lice. This was no small plague. If you've ever seen pictures of the liberation of Bergen-Belsen concentration camp in Nazi Germany in April 1945, they show thousands of mass graves of people, thousands of them, killed by typhus. Typhus was what killed Anne Frank, age 15, and her sister Margot, age 19, at the Bergen-Belsen camp just a month before liberation. Without treatment, deaths may occur in up to 60% of the patients with epidemic typhus, with patients over the age of 60 having the highest risk of death. In the Spanish siege of Moorish Granada in 1489, the Spaniards lost 3,000 men to enemy action, but an additional 17,000 died of typhus. This is plague number three with lice that we have coming into Egypt. Typhus raged among the combatants and civilians in Germany and surrounding countries from 1618 to 1648 and may be accountable for 90% of Europe's casualties by disease at that time. During Napoleon's retreat from Moscow in 1812, more French soldiers died of typhus than were killed by the Russians. 100,000 Irish died of typhus between 1816 and 1819. In the U.S., a typhus epidemic killed the son of President Franklin Pierce and struck in Philadelphia, right across the river from us, in 1837. Other epidemics occurred in Baltimore, Memphis, and Washington, D.C. between 1865 and 1973. Lice not only spread typhus, but they also spread what's called relapsing fever, which has a mortality rate of up to 70% without treatment. You know how you get it? You see a louse on you and you say, ooh, man, I don't like that. Get rid of that baby. And you smush it. That bacteria which develops inside the gut of the louse gets on your skin. It goes through your skin and you get relapsing fever. Or it bites you. It gets into your bloodstream. You have what's called swelling, sweating sickness. Where you have horrible high fevers and break out in horrible sweats all over your body over and over and over again. Lice and blood. You see the connection? It's taking us back to that first plague again. Taking us back to what God did in judgment on Egypt to show that he's the source of life. He can show that through a very small creature, an amazing creature, over 3,000 of them, different types of them, in the world today. But he can put it on man and beast. And he did so. God doesn't tell us how many people in Egypt died as a result of that. He doesn't have to. But as we begin to study what God did there, and see its connection with that first plague, and its connection with creation, which was also demonstrated through that first plague, we see that God is making a point, and it's a very serious point. This was not just an inconvenience for the Egyptians. This was a genuine curse, and when the magicians could not duplicate it, and Pharaoh hardened his heart, it was a demonstration by God that Pharaoh was accountable for his own sin. He was warned by the very people he trusted. He was warned by the people who had contact with demons and who could produce miracles in front of Pharaoh. They warned him. This is the finger of God. And Pharaoh hardened his heart. Dear people, what do you see in the Word of God? What do you see in creation around you? Over the last few days, as I've been walking outside and just enjoying this incredible, beautiful weather after the misery of the winter and all the frozen, broken pipes and all the 
fire alarms going off in the middle of the night and me running over here half dressed trying to keep them from breaking into the gym again like they did when we had the fire over there and getting there just before they took their access to the doors and, you know four o'clock in the morning I'm very happy about the spring weather <laughs> and as I was walking around the church just yesterday walking past the far side and I saw all the flowers that were blooming and robins bouncing around on the lawn and I thought in my heart there is a God in heaven and he made it all the fool hath said in his heart there is no God have you hardened your heart are you like Pharaoh do you understand why lice was such a serious plague in Egypt and did you notice something else here's another thing to notice in this passage God did not make this plague go away. This plague, God did not make this plague go away. He killed all the frogs. He's going to make some other things go away, like the locusts. But with the lice, God did not make this plague go away. And still, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Let me ask you a question. Next time you see a louse, and I hope you don't have one on your head or someplace else, but if you see one, will you be reminded of what God did in Egypt? Plague number three? I hope so, because it is a picture of the judgment of God. It's dangerous. Certain types of disease that are carried by lice, up to 70% mortality. You and I have been bitten by the disease of sin. There's only one anecdote, and it is blood. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, which cleanses us from all sin. It's a 100% cure. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so everyone who looks to Jesus Christ shall live. They lived when they looked in faith. You say, that's not medical. You're right, it wasn't medical. It was supernatural. And when you look to Jesus Christ for salvation, that's not medical. That's supernatural. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Have you done it? Have you pretended to do it? You go to church and think that's going to get you to heaven? You know, if you take a wheelbarrow and put it into a garage, it doesn't become a car. Just like if you take a person who's lost and put him into a church building, he doesn't become a Christian. You have to personally trust in Jesus Christ alone, who took your place on Calvary's cross, paid for your sins by his precious shed blood, died and was buried, he was really dead, and the third day with power, God raised him from the dead. Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. You have to trust him alone. Not trust him plus something else. Not trust him plus your good works. Not trust him plus your church membership. Not trust him plus your parentage. You trust him alone. Because only Jesus can get you all the way from here to heaven. Have you done it? Have you really done it? We just celebrated the resurrection on Sunday. Christ rose from the dead and became the first fruits of them that slept. For as in Adam all die, we just talked about Adam and death, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Have you trusted him? I hope you have. Now, I hope by the time we get through with this series, you'll be able to remember the list of the ten plagues in order from memory. What do we have so far? Blood, frogs, lice. Let's say it again. Blood, frogs, lice. One more time. Blood, frogs, lice. Okay. When we get to 10, we'll see how good you are at that point. Let's pray. <laughs> our gracious Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for your word and for its power. We thank you that you are the creator God. And you do all things well, and you do all things well in judgment as well as in blessing. Father, I pray that if there's someone here today who has not trusted Jesus Christ as his or her Savior, that today they might trust him and believe and be saved. And that you change their life. And Father, we know that there's a change in life because when there is life, there is fruit that is born.
Transform us all, Father, by the working of your Holy Spirit, by the Word of God, that we might bring forth fruit unto righteousness, that we might demonstrate by the way in which we live, the way in which we speak, the way in which we think, our attitudes, our motives, that we belong to Jesus Christ and to none other. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your hymnals and turn to our closing hymn this morning, which is hymn number 603, Jesus, I my cross have taken. <laughs>